Welcome back. This is Erin Hines with Gas and Natural Classroom. At the end of our last video, I asked you to brainstorm some ways soil could be beneficial to us. Let's head out in the yard and I'll share some things I found. The first thing I thought of was clean water. This pump draws water from a well so it rains, the soil filters that water, holds it, and then we can have clean water to drink, or in my case, to water plants with. Which leads me to the second thing I thought of. And this may have been the first thing you thought of, trees. An oak tree like this one has miles of roots underneath the ground, anchored by the soil. The ground captures and holds water, and nutrients from the soil leach into that water. Trees then draw up the nutrient-rich water into their leaves and pump out oxygen. So it's thanks to soil and plants like trees that we have clean air to breathe. Trees aren't the only plants that we need. I live on a farm. This is a peach tree. You can see a young peach starting to grow. And my brother's the farmer. I thought we could track him down and ask him just how important healthy soil is to the health of his plants. Meet my brother, Ethan. Along with my dad and grandparents, he runs Limeburger's farm. He also has a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in soil science. So he is very well qualified to talk to us about soils today. So Ethan, can you tell us what kinds of things you grow? Uh, we grow a lot of different uh, fruits and vegetable crops here. Uh, everything from strawberries and blackberries and peaches to we also grow a few blueberries, lots of vegetables, tomatoes, squash, uh, okra, peppers, uh, also of course pumpkins and multiple other vegetables. How important is soil health for these plants? Well, it's critical because, uh, you know, the plant's job is to photosynthesize um, and create energy that way that it's going to use to complete its reproductive cycle. Okay, pause. Should have warned you, my brother is really smart and it shows, but don't worry, I'm going to translate. So a plant makes fruit to contain its seeds and it gets energy to do that from the sunlight. It converts that energy into a form it can use through a process called photosynthesis. That process happens in the leaves, which are home to a special molecule called chlorophyll. Okay, back to the farm. Your end goal is to, uh, to make the best strawberries, you need the most photosynthesis possible. In order to get the most photosynthesis as possible, the plant needs access to plenty of nutrition to be able to grow those leaves. What's the biggest challenge you face in keeping your soil healthy? Well, there's a lot of different challenges. The main thing uh, that we've seen is an increase in um, high energy, high intensity rainfall events. That's where you get a lot of rain falling in a really short period of time. And that puts a lot of pressure on your soils because of erosion. Uh, all those high energy rains can quickly move an awful lot of soil off your fields and into ponds and things like that. So we're trying to work to balance that by increasing the rate and the kinds of mulches that we use on the farm, as well as uh, utilizing cover crops and even interplanting in cases um, with uh, some plants in between rows of crop plants to hold uh, soil in place better during those rainfall events. Cover crops and interplanting are two soil stewardship practices that aim to keep the soil covered by plants at all times to reduce erosion. You may be wondering why erosion matters. Isn't there more soil where that came from? Yes, but the top six inches of soil has more nutrition for plant roots, and it has to do with the amount of carbon in the soil. I asked Ethan to explain more about that, starting with where does soil carbon come from? Basically, it comes from uh, the plants fix it out of the, uh, out of the air. Uh, they use it to, uh, it's a, they, they take it in and use it as part of their photosynthesis process. And then they will create, uh, uh, they will create exudates and uh, also plant material that get the exudates they push out into the soil and then the plant material when they die gets moved into the soil. Right, let's break that down. So remember photosynthesis, the process by which a plant takes energy from the sunlight in order to reproduce, grow, basically to live? Well, a plant doesn't only need sunlight to make that happen. We talked about how the plant also needs water and nutrients, which it uptakes through the soil, through its plant roots, but it also needs carbon dioxide or CO2 from the air. So the plant takes in that CO2 and then the carbon component of that is either stored in the plant tissue itself or it's pushed out through the 
roots into the soil as carbon sugars. With me so far? It gets better. There are tiny living things called microbes in the soil that actually eat the carbon sugar the plants release. And why that's important is because uh, those microbes are going to allow the plant to ac access a lot of the micronutrients. Most of your micronutrients are uh, not freely available in soil water. It means they're not uh, naturally in soil solutions. So they're not going to move into the root hair. Um, so that it means a plant is relying on these microbial communities to reduce these nutrients and make them available to the plant. In other words, there's actually a mutualistic symbiotic relationship between soil microbes and plants. That's why Ethan wants to farm in a way that increases the amount of carbon in his soil. Soil stewardship practices like cover crops and interplanting help with that, but there are other practices as well. We also get uh, compost from uh, earth farms uh, in Stanley and uh, leaves from the town of Dallas, which we add back to the soil to, in, the, in an attempt to help improve the carbon content of our soils because we started out from a pretty low place. We weren't in a balanced rotation to begin with. So um, those are two amendments that we're currently using uh, in order to increase uh, the amount of carbon in our soil and increase those microbial populations with the aim of uh, making more nutrients available to our plants during those critical growing times. You've mentioned some different practices that you actually use to get more carbon into the soil. Um, could that not counter affect climate change being helpful in that way? You're actually, it sounds like sequestering carbon out of the air and building it into the soil by having farming practices. You know, higher carbon concentrations increase the ability of plants to fix carbon. So as carbon concentrations go up, plants can actually absorb carbon quicker and move it down into the soil faster. Um, now, as to whether that can be done on a scale to combat climate change, I mean, yes, over a long time horizon. And that's how the carbon got out of the atmosphere to begin with plants pulled it out over right. time and it got buried into the soil. Mm -hmm. So that same process will happen again, it's just a matter of time scales. You know, uh, right now uh, we're emitting as a world a lot more carbon than we might be sequestering as farmers. Mm -hmm. um, now if more farmers employed more practices to fix more carbon into their soil, incorporate more carbon into the soil, do you think they could make an impact? Uh, certainly. I mean, uh, the back of the envelope math, you know, just rough calculations, acres of land times, uh, uh, you know, the ability to sequester carbon per acre per year would suggest that the far that farms and farm management has the ability to really remove quite a significant amount of carbon. So not only does soil provide nutrients for the food that we eat, it also counteracts climate change by storing carbon. I could keep going, but we're running out of time, and I think you get the point. Soil is really dang important. All these benefits we've talked about are called ecosystem services, free benefits we get as gifts from the soil ecosystem. And did you catch the biggest threat to healthy soil? Erosion. Again, that's when soil gets washed or blown to a new location. At that point, it's either dirtying our air or our water and not contributing to these benefits we've talked about. So as we think about how to restore soil quality, there's really two main goals. Add carbon and keep the soil in place. For our activity today, you are going to apply these two principles to design a soil-friendly yard or green space around your home. All you'll need is a pencil, paper, and a clipboard, but you may also use graph paper, colored pencils, and a ruler. First, sketch out your existing yard or green space. For example, if you live in an apartment building, you may choose to make a soil-friendly design for a landscaped area adjacent to your building. Go outside with your pencil and paper and inspect your area of interest. Your sketch should be an aerial perspective of the existing area and should include any buildings, paved areas, and plants or vegetation. Note the type of vegetation, bushes, trees, flowers, or grass. Second, mark any eroded areas on your sketch. These are areas that have bare ground, leaving soil exposed to wind and rain. Third, make a plan to address the erosion. Can you cover it with plants? What type? Think about how much sun the area gets. You may wish to research plant options that are native to our area. If the ground isn't suitable for plant growth, for example, if the soil is too compacted, you may consider adding a landscape feature. 
bare areas can be covered by a weed barrier cloth or even cardboard and covered with mulch or rocks. Spruce up the space with potted plants or yard art. Some areas may be eroded because they receive too much water runoff. These areas are good candidates for rain gardens. Research rain gardens to decide if you want to add this to your landscape plan. However you decide to address the erosion, map out the plan on your sketch. Once the erosion is addressed, let's think about how we can add more carbon to our soil. One of the easiest ways to do this is by spreading compost. You can make compost at home by creating a compost pile, making or purchasing a compost bin, or even trying your hand at vermicomposting. Research composting and incorporate a compost pile, compost bin, or worm bin in your landscape plan. And that's it! Helpful links about native plants, rain gardens, and composting are included in the description below. See you next week! Let's pick radishes over here so that they can talk to the video. Yeah.